I'm Hope Coulter, director of the Hendricks Murphy Foundation, and it's my absolute joy to welcome you here tonight after our oh-so-long hiatus from visiting writer events at Hendricks College. The Hendricks Murphy Foundation loves to, to sponsor these events to enhance and enrich the teaching of literature and language at Hendricks. And uh, there will be a, a reception afterwards in Trishman Gallery. We hope you can all linger safely. Uh, I think that things, conditions are such that we can, can do that comfortably now, and we're really glad for that as well. And without further ado, I would like to turn the program over to Zelda Engler Young, who will introduce tonight's guest. Zelda is a. Uh, <laughs> Zelda graduated in, in 20, this, this past May in 2021, an uh, English major. She's here now on Hendricks Five, a program that Hendricks College has made available to students whose college education was affected by the pandemic. It gives them a little uh, chance to take some uh, more courses and enjoy some of those college experiences that they missed during the pandemic. So we're really glad that we have Zelda here. And as you'll hear, uh, she's taking Professor McKendra's course this semester, so Zelda. Uh, hi everybody, I wrote it down because I'm scatterbrained and nervous. It's so good to see you all, so good to be back here. Um, so yes, uh, Frederick McKendra is an essayist and fiction writer. He lives in Little Rock. He attended Howard University and holds an MFA in fiction writing from the New School in New York City and he was named a BuzzFeed Emerging Writer Fellow in 2017, and he often writes about the black and LGBTQ plus experience in the American South. And his writing appears in the Oxford American, Lambda Literary, and BuzzFeed. And I actually had the chance to work with him as a fact-checking intern um, for his Oxford American piece, uh, Seeds Unbound, which was in their summer-fall 2020 issue, their sort of first uh, mid-pandemic issue. Um, about a series by photographer uh, Timothy Hursley of cottonseed storage houses throughout Arkansas. And I remember that, uh, and also I went and found the quote because it was a wonderful quote, um, that Hursley's photos managed to separate the plant from its really damning historical context by, not through any kind of erasure, but by reminding the viewer of Cotton's own biological past, distinct from what callous men made of it and their fellow human beings, of the history and scale of industrial age ingenuity and asking us to look now at what time has made and is still making. And in Professor McKinder's class, um, personal essay writing for the web, he's helped us um, arrive at that same kind of understanding in our own lives and our own writing and that um, with the right lens, you, you don't have to hurt yourself again to tell the story of the parts of your life that are hard and that we have the power to step back and look at what time has made and is still making of us. So I am just so excited to introduce Professor Fred Frederick McKendra. Good evening. Is the microphone good? Yes, okay, good evening. Um, Zelda, thank you so much for that introduction. That was wonderful. Uh, Hope, thank you so much for having me. Um, I am uh, really grateful to the Murphy Program, uh, to the English faculty here at Hendricks for being so welcoming and for bringing me in uh, and um, just helping me, I guess, to acclimate myself to literary culture here in Central Arkansas, which I'm really grateful for, uh, having spent uh, some time away from home to come back and sort of uh, get acclimated into the, the community here uh, has been a process. And so uh, this, this has been a, a really welcome treat, uh, spending the semester here with you all. Uh, so tonight, actually, I thought I have spent so much of the semester with my <laughs> students thinking about nonfiction that I would flip it up a little bit on you all and uh, give some fiction. Uh, which I have not presented for quite some time. Um, so this is the first chapter of my unpublished uh, manuscript uh, that I've been working on for some time. 
Um, it is uh, tentatively titled The Ticket. Um, and that's all the preamble I'll give. So I'll start from there. Okay. <clears throat> Nothing in the jostle of blue line passengers alerted Theo Lovelace the Friday he sold the first ticket. No alarm sounded, no sirens rang out along the corridor as he rushed along at a pace intended to recover the 10 minutes he was now late for work. A smile stitched into his face as though he were soliciting clemency for this from the crowd. The smile went unnoticed, unremarked, which hurt him a little because he assumed it meant they expected no good humor out of him. Not at all imposing at 5'9", but a black man nonetheless, with shoulders whose width carried their own implicit demand for space and which moved with a kind of street slang. That any expression of cheeriness from him seemed insincere. The smile just sat there, fizzling on his face until it fell. He lowered his head and continued nosing his way through the crowd. He consoled himself by marking off the six months he'd kept the job he was now late for, recalling how he'd managed to, to stanch the surges of pride and self-doubt that had alternated through his body until sometimes it had seized, keeping him supine in his apartment for days, unable to adjust lines of address on any more cover letters, and sore from masturbating to internet porn. He'd taken being fired from the position whose salary had first gotten him to the city easily enough, assuming he'd find something comparable before falling too behind on rent. He had not anticipated the lag in entry-level jobs he would face, nor how difficult it would become to raise himself for the unpaid internships or the wage jobs that barely skimmed his monthly expenses. Finally, he bore his way down here to the lotto stand, which paid out weekly rather than bi-weekly, always leaving a couple of 20s in his pocket, enough to fling resignedly at cigarettes or liquor or fast food and forget that even a month's worth of these checks did not sum to what he owed in rent and bills, that did he spend none of it, still he would inevitably fail to break even. He surged against the crowd again, fleeing the panic that gripped at him any time he surveyed his financial outlook and found himself surrounded by the workmen who herded here at the station around three in the afternoon. He abandoned himself to ogling them so as to forget his predicament. They paid him no mind. Having arrived some time before sunrise to shove the planks into place that girded the city against perpetual collapse, they milled around now, headed back to their native grounds, places called Massapequa and Yapank. Around the time Theo arrived at Penn Station, they were everywhere, stalking the tile among the commuters, and he could make it right up on them. He negotiated the crowd so as to pass close enough to inspect one that had propped himself against a pillar, a strong man in repose. Theo watched the obscenity pump up and down the man's big roughhouse frame, humpy arms and chest and legs, the heft settled down through his hips into the jutting, broadened ass of his shapeless jeans. Apparently the unions had come to a vote, apparently the unions had put it to a vote come to a unanimous decision against shirt sleeves, and this one had heartily concurred. <laughs> Theo traced the pink and rings around the man's stark arms, the sun having marked him like a jealous girlfriend's cheap lipstick. His eyes lingered as the man raised the brown paper bag to his lips, watching him lick down beer from a tall boy can right out in the open. A garish tag, done in the colors of a temporary tattoo from the 4th of July had been stamped onto the man's chest, Union 242. The men appeared feral, the names of the tribal grounds they'd appropriated appearing on a lighted board above their heads. Their predecessors, the indigenous tribes now gone from Long Island, haunted that land now in name alone. Still, some vestige of the place's gaminess, its rural air, furred its present inhabitants. To Theo, they warranted a definitive study, a pictorial capturing them in beefcake poses, perhaps, packaged in a pinup packaged, packaged in a pinup calendar, novelty playing cards, trinkets he would have branded the ethnic white studs of Long Island. 
His legs hummed negotiating the terminal, his mind aware of the minutes compiling beyond his shift start time. He dared not lose this job, even if it did demoralize him. The workman held his post as Theo moved along. From, from one's broad back to another's plump ass to a pair of wide set shoulders, Theo's yearning spilled across the throughway. To the one in the neon yellow cutoff there, whose shirt bounced light like a caution sign against the flagrant red of his arms and neck and face, Theo plunged into the shame that arose in him, catching sight of the tender ivory flesh of the man's exposed underarm. He cowered from the repulsion he imagined such a man would feel at his appetite for just such a broad belly. How greedily he eyeballed the sweat rings drying at the man's salt lick of a neck. Theo's whole body riled at these sensations of embarrassed pleasure, like holding it a few seconds longer at the urinal before peeing. <laughs> he caught the smell of damp pretzel dough on the air from the Auntie Anne's a level above him. A rush of commuters at his back knocked him from this reverie like a belch, their velocity driving him forward along the striations in the curved ceiling as though he were being shot through a barrel. Above them, the city pressed like a fist, squeezing the foot traffic through a tube. Columns appeared at random, wrapped in a reflective silver that caught and shot off sparks of neon in Theo's periphery. The passage like the exposed guts of an arcade machine, some coked up designer's idea of futurism from the 80s. Midway down the corridor, he laughed giddily at the sight of a military reservist stationed to his left, all the testosterone caught down here seeming to summon his own, a burbling that rushed up and flushed through his brain and limbs, enthralled by the rare gift of his desire. Siphoning these pleasures from such improbable sources felt illicit. There was an insolence in his voyeurism, in the way he flayed them, born of his anger that they never took notice of him, which coursed through his body like blood. He raked his eyes across the dunes of the man's camo uniform like acrylic nails. Though not until he caught the tang of a day's worked body on the air did he just say fuck it to his tardiness. Let his attention flit after his nose, away from the job, away from his bills. Because what? He sensed an odor like that only coming off a guy raring to tote his body out to Long Island and fuck him? Install him in a kitchen somewhere and tether him to a life free of concern? That was his version of a windfall anyway, a man to lay up under, and the mundane security he heard in the words, finished basement. Certainly not the glittered foil zeros on the scratch-offs he sold. He alighted on a burly guy in a blue tank top tucked into carpenter's jeans. Smelling like that, of course the guy tucked in his undershirt, as doing so gave his physique a torso, a waist, a fat ass, showed off the fragrant pom-poms of fluff festooning either side of his chest. There was either a showiness or a bit of desperation in letting all that skin out onto the air, contrasted against all the other buttoned up commuters especially. Theo reveled in reading low rent onto guys like these, never feared, that, never feared they had any idea what he made of them or what he did to their bodies right out in public. He heard the hiss of flank steak being slapped atop a flat grill, then the shrill bleat of a Spanish girl crying, free sampler, free sampler from the smoothie place. He looked back at the reservist, gorging on the sight of both men and on what he smelled, odor having defined his desire since puberty, his predilection for the funk of men's bodies having been the inexorable proof he needed to declare himself both to himself and to God. He relished it closing his eyes and shuddering in the euphoria of it until something rushed up and knocked him backward. The union guy's damp and fleshy warmth. For a moment, he feared he'd been pushed, recognized and rebuffed, though not before picking up the scent he'd been targeting all along, a fact his body acknowledged and delighted in. What the fuck, man, the guy said, which sent Theo's eyes to the floor, nothing to offer in response. He had no idea how to engage such men when spoken to. And gratefully, silence sufficed. He felt afraid, of course, and made a show of trembling, seeking whatever sympathy he could summon. And the guilt was there all over his face, 
the look of a house pet caught pleasuring its genitals against the prickly fabric of a family room sofa. He understood the violence that was to come, how much he deserved it this time. But of all the guy could have done in that moment, grab Theo up by the collar, yank him in close, unleash spit and breath into his face, to simply reach back and feel for his wallet stung Theo the worst. He wanted to be called to account this time, to confess that he'd been drawn by the man's warmth, the animal comfort in the man's stocky build, that he'd gotten caught up in this distraction, that there was something about the perpetual dim of this corridor, the dingy light from the bulbs overhead, the way the artificial pallor denied the passage of time and gave everybody down here an air of sleaze. Of all the vile things Theo had been doing to the man's body, the last thing on his mind had been the man's cash, even if he could have used the money. Having relegated him to little more than a potential pickpocket, the guy plowed off again down the walk, his odor now indistinguishable from the vague stink of cumin seared onto someone's nearby grill. Theo looked back for the reservist, who too had abandoned his post. Glum, he set off again. There was never much danger of his leering being found out, not in the camouflage his body offered, not in the brown thread of his skin, which warded off any presumption of him having any desire to connect or be used. He pulled the weight of his body back up into his shoulders as he began moving, not allowing it to undulate down through his hips. Past the bookstore with its fat spy novels and greeting card displays, he employed the rare privilege of his body, its invisibility, he sometimes convinced himself that the way these men left all their flesh on display, neither flaring their chests nor sucking in their bellies, but just letting it all hang out was a kind of tacit permission they were granting him, but it was not. They just never noticed his appetite, which of course made it more incessant. His desire never sated. He did not have it in him to admire the punchy frame to his left slung over a counter the chunky butt turned up and exposed to the streaming crowd, just noted it coolly, objectively, until the man came upright and Theo recognized the figure as that of his boss, Seymour, who turned in Theo's direction almost immediately. From the scowl on Seymour's face, Theo knew to set himself to appear to be listening intently. There's machines can do this job, you know, Seymour said, that'll make fewer mistakes, too. Machines that'll be here 24-7. He meant that as a threat, motioning over his shoulder toward the scratch-off vending machines across the hall with those thick, fondant fingers of his. They both knew Theo was safe for now. Customers still preferred tickets printed and handled by human hands, some vestige of belief in the fortuitous potential of human error. The machines picked an impatient customer from Theo's line once or twice a week, but usually they returned, shaking their heads. Something about the cold calculation of a machine running counter to their faith in a happy accident. Still, Seymour used this threat whenever he wanted to express displeasure with Theo. Not much saving your place here other than the fact that you can smile, he said. And so Theo smiled because Seymour had told him to. That's it. That's why you're here, Seymour said. Delighting, Theo thought in landing this stroke of dominance. Theo nuzzled into Seymour's voice, its sound patting him like little swats to the ass. He discovered he liked Seymour's rough handling and so had to play, pay close attention not to give this away and instead give the impression of respecting the man. He liked the foulness of Seymour's speech, the feel that fat tongue gave off of some dirty, dirty disco. He found that sometimes he wanted to kiss it just to feel that slug in his mouth. It belonged on a 70s porn actor, that tongue, gave Seymour the seasoned, rafish air of a conolingus legend. <laughs> like, the, like the Union men, Seymour also lived somewhere out on the island and carried its mark of obsessive grooming. His electric tans burnished him like a bird glazed in its own juices. He'd spent money on home gym equipment that he used to work off the anxiety of running a dying business, a regiment that kept his tits perked and his belly stout. Theo would watch him pacing the terminal floor sometimes, squat as a house, thick as a brick, and feel tender toward him, 
enough to withstand the threats and the wet, lascivious curses that sometimes surfaced from that gut. That's why he took the paddling, he thought, as he opened the bottom half of the stand's stable door and stepped inside. Because the way Seymour salivated when he talked led Theo to imagine his boss putting down some serious OG pillow talk, the lusty conjugal visit kind. Once inside the stand, bunched between the machine and rolls of scratch-off tickets sputtering spe 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 spectacular in books of 30 or more, he tried to ignore the tongue of one of the rolls lapping at the back of his neck. He imagined his oversized head drew customers to him, competing against the below ground entrance to a big box store to his right and a cheesesteak place to his left. You all right in there, Seymour asked, to which Theo nodded, gritting his teeth to continue smiling. Good, listen, a girl from the Lotto Commission called this morning, said something about remote updates rolling through the network all day. Theo tapped the screen awake and began surveying the keys for any changes that might have thrown off his pace. He could now cycle through whole litanies of number combinations, his savvy with the machine a quiet point of pride, which he demonstrated with semi-conscious flourishes. If it happens while you're with a customer, just send him across the hall, okay? Theo lingered on Seymour's junkyard strut as the man made his way down the corridor, then settled into the shift ahead of him the standing, the waiting, the burning off of hours until a customer came. He leaned his head back, staring into the single fluorescent bulb above his head. He let the pressure build behind his eyes until he was drenched in dizziness, then weightless, able to float away from the press of bodies out in the corridor, the past due rent that nagged at him, the needling concerns of whether to opt for cigarettes that would quell his appetite or for food which would do nothing to satisfy his need for a smoke. He felt able to tuck himself into the anonymity of selling lotto tickets in this tunnel of the city where he hoped his pride might recover from the exhaustion he felt. He drew back into himself once a customer arrived. One dollar on the take five and five dollars on the mega. Theo's hands raced ahead of his consciousness across the machine's touchscreen while the rest of him came too. They could have done the work themselves, really. He recognized the customer across from him as a regular. Big black dude, washed out velour track suit, head of cornrows beneath a fitted cap. He'd never troubled the dude for his name, though. The same age or just about that of the union men from moments ago, and yet every trace of that ardor had left him. Instead, he felt a marmish exasperation for this guy, who, like most of his customers, was black, male, and hulked around the station in rap costumes from the late 90s. Still, this trans tra transaction he had to smile through, and so did. And let me get some of them winning tickets from back there, too, not them empty ones y'all been handing out here recently. Theo got this often enough to catch himself before sneering. Most meant it as a joke, but he heard it frequently enough to know some of them actually believed he somehow controlled who won that he doled out winning tickets from a stash he kept behind the counter. It rankled him, then them harboring such a dumbass idea, which only reinforced how much of a joke he was for being here. Dude, Theo said, though he'd have preferred using the N-word. If I had him, I wouldn't have any problem giving him to you. He heard the attempted playfulness in his voice, the jocularity he tried to rouse with most of his customers to mask his judgment of them. He tried to hold himself above the sharp disdain he saw directed at their backs in lines at corner stores throughout Brooklyn, wanting to think of himself as more generous of spirit than that. Yeah, whatever. Last week, y'all ain't give out no winners. Nothing. All week. Theo rarely granted men like this much nuance, much less an audience. He suspected sometimes that his impatience with them grew from fear of things they might have said about him that Theo had no business in a city like New York in the first place, too much of Bama to make anything of himself, certainly to imagine anyone would care enough about him or his ideas for him to make a living off them. And of course, there was the eternal fear of men like this clock clocking his wrist action, or worse still, his predilection for pink dick. And deeper than that even, perhaps he feared their humanity, their potential to surprise him, because maybe they'd best him, 
at least when it came to something like surviving, and maybe they'd explode his narrow notions of who they were, proved to be more than just a foothold for his own eventual rise back above ground. This shamed him, how quickly he enacted the same dismissal much of the city directed at him, and so he, he resorted to small talk in order to dispel his bad mood. You have a good celebration for the fourth? Spend some time with the fam, do a cookout or something? Rambling in order to keep the talk up, he found himself voicing his own pains, the family he missed, the gatherings, cousins, aunts, uh, uncles, men about like this guy who played the lotto themselves and so might generously peel off a $20 bill did he ask and they have it to spare. Having exiled himself here, swapped family for a dream and the chance to ogle men without shame, he pined now for the things he bartered away. In response, the customer offered little more than a grunt, a scratch of the cotton t-shirt across his distended belly, and a shrug, his eyes remaining on the tickets he'd been handed as he turned away. It affirmed the disdain Theo felt for his customer. Much of his day of performance meant to deny this to himself. He used them, most of them reminding him of people he knew back home, to confirm the assumptions he made the surety of his judgments returning some measure of his pride, a sorry consolation he was embarrassed for needing. Sometimes their rapport became easy when he allowed himself to be apart, when he wasn't angry at them for his being here, for having clutched him back underground. On occasion, when they told him that there was fuzzy shit in his beard, the flood of gratitude he felt shocked him, perhaps because he needed some of their tending to. It also shocked him how quickly they got up on him. Give me a $2 win for life and two of them take five scratches and a loose chain. Still smarting from the last exchange, he took his time in turning to rip these cards from the rolls behind him. They didn't mind. In fact, it was their patience that needled him the most, the ones who deferred to his little cruelties. They bore his attitude because he wasn't going nowhere. He was one of them, in fact. If his hardiness meant he maintained a distinction between their circumstances and his own, then their forbearance mocked his vanity, meant that they saw him as no better and were in fact laughing in his face. But they could go on believing in his shit if they wanted to, he told himself, that luck was going to somehow multiply their measly singles into thousands. He knew better, he thought, though he hadn't managed to get much out of much of what he'd wished for out of life so far either. Mostly he found relief in those who simply tossed back his fake cheer with indifference. His smile meant nothing of value to their day, nor to the private dream they conjured with their tickets now in hand. The afternoon proceeded in this way, Theo barely aware of himself or them unless he was complimenting one of the office women for a change in her hair's cut or color, or noting the music of a particular accent. Caribbean voices that turned threes into trees, like Mr. Hereford's, the Jamaican day laborer who worried aloud if the visa lottery that had brought him to the U.S. in the first place had cost him all of whatever luck he'd been allotted in this life, or the southern ones from the Carolinas that made him homesick. Mostly it was just, let me get $3 on the Mega Billions and Theo changing someone's $50 bill. And so he just blinked out, digits running through his ear his fingers at work across the screen, his face as blank as a screensaver. There was a numbing pleasure in it, though, that helped him forget what he had not done. For he was supposed to have done it by now, created a simulacrum of himself and presented it to the world, one that the world would have loved enough to allow him some security and some joy, some of the pleasure he knew was mostly reserved for people that were straight and rich and white, He'd managed so far to avoid any bullets or disease or bashings. He had not allowed the prospects presented gay black men to embitter him, but he knew he could not remain this way for long, felt terror for what would become of him did he continue depending upon a rhythm his hands made, his lone talent making flourishes with his fingers to impress someone, not so far beyond the boy he'd once been longing to snap his fingers and pop his neck like the banshee girls back in junior high school. Nothing long term, he told himself the day he'd taken Seymour's offer to stand beneath a neon pin lotto sign 
and become a grinning good luck dispenser, the fortune teller machine in the movie Big. Just a quick step down, less money, but less commitment. Something until he could again convince someone that he was one of the ones who smiled, one of the ones who possessed the college level vocabulary. Honestly, he cringed most every time he had to sell a ticket to a black man, even when they arrived in business suits. He judged them more harshly, never failing to notice the flaw in their presentation, the dingy collar, shiny patches in their suit fabric, shoes buffed too long, or in the case of the man standing before him, a coat so baggy it appeared borrowed. He saw such thin hope in all their preening. The same ambition he read about in dispatches from back home about home foreclosures, the fool's errand that was drawing niggas down to Georgia or North Carolina like fruit flies, the same dumb pride that was convincing repatriators that after years of rent payments in northern cities, home ownership was possible for them too until the bank came to repossess their houses. Selling lotto tickets to these men made him the predatory lender, though he didn't know to connect those home foreclosures to his own diminished prospects. Failed to read the economic weather on that scale. Insisting instead on distinguishing himself from those folks by personalizing his predicament. <coughs> Excuse me. Dreading that what he told himself all along about his great promise about the truth he could see in the world that few else were brave enough or honest enough to see had all been a lie, a trick of his ego. He looked to the man who was studiously checking his tickets as though soothing the daily numbers would somehow prove his capacity for erudition. The theatrics in this sent a wave of nausea through Theo, but only because that's all he'd ever managed to do either. Don a suit and stand around trying to convince people <coughs> he was something he now feared he was not. All good, my man? Mind letting me out, Theo asked, needing to escape, hoping to go on my break. Oh, let me just get one more, my brother. Give me just a second. Theo expended his entire repertoire of passive aggressive sounds and gestures as the man first pulled a bet slip from the rack and began filling in numbers before deciding against that and just going with a quick pick. Sometimes it's better to go with what the computer says, you know, the man said. Theo heard him, <coughs> excuse me, Theo heard him wait a second for a cheerful response, but did not raise his eyes from the door's handle until he heard the man turn and leave. He and Seymour had never even, dis even discussed the matter of breaks. Leaving required he shutter the place entirely, an unsanctioned halt in the day's business. Any other job would have fired him by now, but Seymour was hardly around. Locking the door, he tried to deny the sensation, but he felt it in himself, a desire to solicit attention, cat calls, and the way his ass clenched, his thighs compressed, pushing his center of gravity up, tilting his pelvis, pelvis forward so that as he began walking, he heard swishing. Thank you. Thank you. He heard swishing, the sound of his body telling on itself. The phone inside the stand started ringing just as he returned, reaching for the key. He needed that. <laughs> he assumed it was Seymour and so began freaking immediately. Uh, he'd gone too far taken too many mid-shift breaks, or maybe Seymour had discovered the bills he'd sometimes slipped from the cash box. Somehow, Seymour knew every indiscretion all of a sudden, and Theo could feel it coming, this final indignity, fired again, only this time from a job barely paying him minimum wage. He knew it would crush him finally, that it would set him packing, back to the airport, but first to call home, for the one-way ticket he'd always dreaded asking his parents for. He picked up but supplied no greeting. Theo, you there? Just checking in, he heard Seymour say through the earpiece. We're good, he replied, detecting no threat in Seymour's voice as for now, patting his own voice down to sound even and smooth. Has it happened yet? The remote reboot returned to his mind in an instant, but he had no way of knowing if it had already happened. His screen read, press to start, 
the same as it always did on standby. Nope, not yet, he said. Not that I could tell anyway. Did they say what time? Afternoon? Evening? Probably going to happen during a rush then. Damn it. I got you, Seymour. Don't even worry about it, he said, placating Seymour while panic skittered down his own body. Seymour warned him to stay alert and then hung up. He stood there, blinking through scenarios where Seymour might discover him until something did happen to the machine. Twenty or so minutes later, the screen blinking blank, a roll of numbers running up its face before rebooting from black to teal to black again, as usual. Though things could sometimes go haywire due to the remote ma manipulations from the Lotto Commission, phantom keys appearing without warning, hovering for a few days before disappearing without explanation, this time every key reappeared in its place once the machine had pow powered on fully. Through two customers, Theo was back to drumming out finger beats at his usual speed, giving the appearance of maintaining some control over the machine and the fate it dispensed though obviously he had none. He felt relief, then a twinge to reward himself with nicotine, which only reminded him of what he had to do now. Peel a couple of dollars off the take for today, enough for a fresh pack and something to eat tonight, maybe. Might as well get it over with. The women would be arriving soon anyway, whose conversations he did not mind so much. Rather than keep bills ordered in a till, they were heaped inside a metal box, six inches deep, on a shelf at about the height of Theo's thighs. To make change, one pulled whatever denomination was needed from the pile, a system that was surprisingly faster but much more disorderly. There was pleasure just in rifling through such a pile of cash for anyone making as small a wage as this one especially. It induced a kind of delirium that money was plentiful and that no one actually tallied the final take at the end of the day. That's how Theo managed to rationalize taking a few bills for himself every now and then anyway, slipping two out today, first two 20s, then opting instead for 120 and 110. He glanced down to check the bill's denominations, but otherwise kept his eyes up, focusing on the middle distance. He felt a tremor of fear over what his hands were doing but only until he managed to get the bills folded and slid past the seam of his butt pocket. Most of the women who made it by to play before the draw ended were like Ernestine and Rosalie, arriving in pairs and a Twitter like church missionaries, women for whom the game was just something to play, a jolt of want they barely believed would come true, but they kept their day pushing along until evening. Women who knew better than to pant over the fantasy scapes plastered sporadically around the city by the Lotto Commission, ads that never featured women like them, that instead peopled the beach escape scenes or comic visions of wealth they depicted with young white bodies, the kind of people his customers probably felt a good humor pity for, their privilege having left them fragile and in need of care. Ernestine had been his grandmother's name, and so he loved her, plus the two women kindled a youth in one another that tickled him. How obstinate Ernestine seemed, opting for jet black wigs, though Rosalie was graying naturally. The jaunty angle to which her bangs sometimes slipped, so that her helmet of hair appeared asymmetrical, mimicking the girls from 90s R&B videos whose sharp love lyrics he loved. Stuff like that he savored, reminding him of the feel of actual friendship, warm through and damp. For women like that, he filled most any requests, standing more attentive, handing them their ticket, not like this, not like that, like this, even blowing on his fingertips for luck if they wanted him to. He'd been looking out for them when they showed later than usual. We'd have been here sooner if she hadn't been so long talking to that bus driver upstairs, Rosalie Sage whispered to Theo conspiratorially. She cut her eyes from her friend playfully. Child, whatever. Ernestine returned, head so far down in her purse. Theo made out the seam of her hairpiece. A man like that upstairs ain't gonna never hold me up. Theo, I don't know what she even talking about, baby. Mm-hmm, Rosalie said, handing Theo her bed slips to be fed into the machine. Five quick ones and she was through, just like most days. She tucked the tickets into the outer lip of her purse and stood waiting for her girlfriend. 
Ernestine played a little bit looser, more improvisationally. Okay, now you know I want me some, some triples. Let me get the odds, Ernestine said, and Theo dutifully printed 111-333-555-777-999, the triples being the easiest to hit on, which meant they were most likely to be sold out. And then let me see, Ernestine said, before beginning to chew on her lip. Girl, come on, Rosalie said, we're gonna be late for the train. They rode in daily from somewhere in New Jersey. Go ahead, I'm gonna be right behind you. I just gotta remember this one I had in my head this morning. Go, save us some seats. Rosalie took this reluctantly, willing to stay, of course, and no doubt dreading a ride home alone. But Ernestine shooed her, and, she, and as she began toward the New Jersey transit area, as quick as that, Ernestine was back to Theo. Her air of indecision dissipated. Baby, let me just get a few more, she said, checking over her shoulder to ensure Rosalie had not stalled before continuing. I tell you, the way I've been coming up short these past months, something's up. You keeping count, Miss Ernestine, Theo asked, surprised that she'd even been clocking such a thing. How you know you coming up short? Don't you always lose money on these things? Huh? Most of them do, but not me, honey. This ain't how I play, that, that ain't how I play. I got me a system. I'm supposed to stay just about even. Money I win, that's the same I play. And a pot's supposed to stay about full. But these last two months or so, I've been having to put more on it, add more and more cash to my pot. I ain't done nothing different, so it's got to be her, I'm thinking. <laughs> she, she looked as though she were ashamed to say it, kept her eyes down, not wanting to look over what she just said straight on. I tried everything, you hear me? Different shoes on different days, different handbags, nothing. I'm afraid to say it, but I might have to drop her. Just start coming by myself at lunchtime. But even that's gonna be hard, seeing as how we eat together most days. <laughs> it's like that, Theo asked, aghast. She wasn't kidding either, looking serious as a follow-up doctor's visit. I'm usually like clockwork on them cash word scratch-offs up there, the green ones. Got about 900 off that one card last year. This year, I'm not even close to that. Who you think is responsible for me coming up short like that? Not me. But that's, but that's supposed to be your friend, though, Miss Ernestine, he said, a whine entering his voice. He didn't want to see the city make one more pair of friends part ways. He'd had enough of that in his own life recently. Friend, nothing, she said, in a voice he didn't recognize from her. Then she said, hand me three of them cash words up there, the green ones, and see don't I pull some money off one of them. Theo turned and ripped down three of the scratch cards she was indicating and held them out to her though he did not smile at it. Theo had always regarded Ernestine as far from the coven of women he thought legit crazy about the game, their habits ingrown. It was as though a root had been worked on her, and now he found himself wondering what she'd actually do if these cards came up empty. He hoped it would return her to Rosalie, as these days he relied on the surety of good friends being able to reconcile. Perhaps it would tip her over into madness or worse, Depression. He hoped for the former, of course, just knowing the tickets would turn out empty. He wasn't sure to what extent he could, to, could assist her in the case of a crisis. He could barely hold himself. And yet, not halfway through scratching the first card, she let out, let out an oop, showing him it was guaranteed to be at least a $10 winner. Then the second card came up empty, but the third revealed he owed her $40 more dollars winning a total of 50 after having paid him only $6. Baby, just give me 44 back, she said, and he reluctantly reached down for her winnings. I knew it. That girl's been shorting my luck all this time. I should have known. Keep your luck for yourself. That's what the old folks used to say. Serve me right for trying to be a friend. This stung Theo, not wanting to believe there might be some reason for friends to part ways, no matter what. And can you give me these 50-50 for the drawing tonight? It was heartbreaking to see a friend dump just like that, like a schoolgirl. No question she'd be showing up herself from now on, her voice seemed to say. And let me get one of those mega tickets for the draw tonight. No telling what my luck is gonna do now. Folks turned on one another down here just like that. Theo couldn't help but to think he'd been abandoned down here also, 
by the boy he failed to stop himself from falling for, a struggle that had so preoccupied him he hadn't noticed himself hurtling until he'd landed here. He wondered anyone's capacity for caring for someone attached by something so flimsy as that, friendship. Ernestine offered her own response by turning her back to him and heading off down the corridor, not even waiting around for him to wish her luck. Thank you. And I guess now I'm supposed to uh, just, yeah, if you all have any questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I will uh, try and respond as well as I can. Any questions for now? Yes. Savannah, do you want to personally worked in a bookstore in Penn Station uh, and uh, my one of my bosses decided to start selling lotto tickets uh, in order to make money to supplement the bookstore and so I was really fascinated by the culture of uh, lotto players it was like I had been living in uh, in New York I guess for about like three years by then and I was it was it was like being encountering a completely different subsection of the city than the sort of college transplants that I was sort of circulating uh, with. And so um, that's, I think, where the germ of the story started mm -hmm. and wanting to, wanting to find some way of, of capturing um, that world. Mm -hmm. Yes? How do you decide which stories are meant for a nonfiction piece versus which ones are meant for a fiction piece if so many of them are kind of, you know, the germ is based on your own experience. Right, right. Um, that is tough. And I, I don't, I guess I'm just so promiscuous. I'll use whatever, <laughs> <laughs> whatever comes to mind. I, um, I did find as I was writing, uh, working on this novel, because for a long time, I, I only considered myself a fiction writer and really just devoted myself to fiction. Uh, and I did find um, soon, or so, soon before, or really close to the time that I started uh, at BuzzFeed, um, that a lot, my writing is really exposition heavy and a lot of that exposition uh, can exist in a different place away from um, the fictional narrative so that I can keep the momentum going. Um, and so it became a really nice sort of pressure valve uh, for my fiction. Uh, if I uh, took a lot of those ideas that were sort of swirling around a fictional project and just put them into a nonfiction project. Um, so yeah. I, hopefully that re that responds to your question, if not exactly answers it. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Yes. So novels themselves are very long. Mm -hmm. um, how do you complete something so long? What is that like? Oh, it's a marathon. <laughs> um, I, you know, I. There is a term. Maybe a German term. That I read somewhere. And I told myself I was going to remember it forever, and I <laughs> clearly have not. But um, there is a term for this concept about uh, your novel inspiring uh, you to do the amount of work uh, that you need to do in order to complete it. And I feel like um, that that was true of this project. Like, I started working on this novel. I don't know if you all noticed the sections about home foreclosures, but that was happening all the way in, back in like 20, 2009, 2010. Uh, so I started this project in September of 2010, and I did not um, get it 
actually submitted by an agent until 2019. So it took about like nine years uh, of sustained work on it. Um, but I think that there was something about the idea, the idea was so expansive, the idea of a lottery being, um, being sort of this, this, this windfall, this, this perspective windfall in a person's life and what that meant to a character like Theo who was so overcome with desire. Um, something about that idea felt so expansive that it, it, I, I found the energy to, to continue working on it. And I really think that each project sort of inspires the level of, of energy that you need in order to sustain yourself through it. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, let's continue the conversation in Cushman Gallery. I know that uh, the Hendricks Murphy Foundation staff has come together to be working hard on this reception. And so please linger and enjoy. And meanwhile, Thank you all so much for being here. This is really sweet.